Okay, this is the second of a series of end of course videos over U.S. history, end of course EOC star videos. Uh, this is over chapter 5 of the Jared book, and the title is The Industrialization and the Gilded Age. If you were to watch these videos and these videos alone, you would have a, a pretty good idea of what would be on the star test. Would you pass it? It's possible. Uh, this is a very concise and a very precise uh, look at the material. It is not all that there is that you need to know, but it does look at the bulk, the most important things, and we're going to walk through it together. And so, uh, let's go ahead and begin. There's only about five or six slides, so it should take us a little over 20 minutes or so. Again, our title, Industrialization of the Gilded Age. Uh, America industrializes rapidly after the Civil War. When the Civil War ended in 1865, the uh, United States goes through a period of time which we refer to as the Gilded Age. Now, the Gilded Age is a period of great corruption. Corruption at all levels of society, from government corruption, uh, business corruption, even corruption at the individual level. And so part of that is due to the industrialization of America, the growth of big business. Not that industry is evil in and of itself, not that evil is corrupt, but the growth of industry in America led to the creation of great wealth. And a huge chunk of that wealth was situated in the hands of a small number of people. They wanted to make more money. Again, why do we go into business? We go into business, as it states here, people go into business for profit, to make money. Now, is there such a thing as making too much money? Well, I don't think so. Can you make money through uh, the right way? Yes, you can. Can you make a lot of money doing things the wrong way? Yeah, you can as well. And so, because of what is referred to as laissez-faire economics, which we have discussed previously. Because of laissez-faire government hands-off, business, businesses were allowed to grow, often unchecked by the government, which led to corruption. And we're going to talk about some of that as we go. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at, first thing I'm going to mention, or next thing really, is the free enterprise system, capitalism. The free enterprise system, you are free to produce and sell goods, and or services. You start a business uh, and you open a bakery, well, you provide a good, donuts. You open a business and you provide technical support for comp computers, you're providing a service. So in the free enterprise system, in capitalism, in the free market system, you are free to produce and sell goods with hopefully as little government intervention as possible. Now again, how much the government intervenes, that's the issue. Under laissez-faire capitalism, which took place in America in the late 1800s up through about 1929 or so when the stock market collapsed, we actually even passed 1929. It's not really till we get to the Roosevelt administration in 1933 that we start to move away from laissez-faire into more of a very much hands-on. Now, in between, we do have, uh, in the early 1900s, we do have progressivism, which we'll take up in another video, in which the government attempts to fix some of the problems of the Gilded Age through legislation. But really, this hands-off approach, laissez-faire, doesn't really end until the 1930s. Okay. Prices are set by the concepts of supply and demand. All things being equal, supply and demand rules a free enterprise system. Supply, that is the amount of goods for sale. Demand is the desire to purchase those goods. Okay? So a couple of set rules with supply and demand. If, and I'm going to try a quick illustration... If supply goes up, that's supposed to be an arrow. It's not a very good one. I apologize. If supply goes up, prices tend to fall. The more there is of a good, the more there is of a good to be purchased, the prices tend to fall. Okay? Well, let's move on to something else. I'm not doing a very good job of erasing. 
think that will do. Okay. If supply falls, prices tend to rise. If the supply of a good, if the amount of a good on the market to be purchased drops, prices tend to rise. And that holds pretty much the same, pretty much with few exceptions. There are a few exceptions to the rule, but by and large, that holds. Okay, let's go to demand. If the demand for a good increases, more people want to buy something, prices also tend to increase. The more people want to buy something, whether it be uh, Miley Cyrus, you know, concert tickets or chocolate covered donuts or Ferraris, doesn't really matter. If that price, I'm sorry, if that demand goes up, if more and more people want to buy it, prices are going to go up as well. Okay, let's take one more quick look at demand. Let's look at it from the other perspective. If demand falls for a good, people don't want to buy it, prices are going to fall as well. Those four items, those four concepts tend to remain the same regardless. Donuts, Ferraris, paper clips, blondes, brunettes, Miley Cyrus tickets. I mean, whatever bizarre, disgusting thing, Miley Cyrus, Justin Bieber concerts, uh, that you're talking about or anything cool, it stays the same. So, freedom of choice the right to profit. That's the free enterprise system. All right, let's move on to our next slide. Contributions of the government. Now, I am, as big as you're going to find, uh, anti-government guy in terms of, in, of messing with in, intervening into business. You're not going to find a whole lot who believe in that more than I do. However, there are some things, there are some things the government needs to do. Today, one of the biggest, biggest, biggest disagreements I have with President Barack Obama, and you know this is being filmed on January 18th, 2016, is that he is much more of a government intervention guy than I am. He believes the government should be involved in any and everything that you and I, American citizens, do. I think there is a limit, and that limit is called the Constitution. But even someone like me who wants to see the government get the heck out of my way as much as possible... There are things that the government needs to do. We'll talk about some of those. Protection of property in contracts. If I sign an agreement with you and you fail to live up to your side, your part of it, then there should be a recourse. I can take, there should be action I can take through the government, through the courts, through the police if necessary, in order to ensure that you live up to your agreement. Protection of property. Again the police, the military, those are things that the government is supposed to do, supposed to provide for us protection. Again, we've gone over the Constitution. We went over it in the last in the course uh, video that uh, hopefully you've seen and seen several times. It is quite good, I, if I say so myself, which I do. The Constitution is really a guideline for what the government can do and, more importantly, what it cannot do. One of the things it is required to do is to, for example, provide a military to protect us from foreign enemies. So those are that's one of the things, a couple of things the government needs to do. Okay, let's move forward. The passing of protective tariffs. Now, again, I don't necessarily think this is a great idea, but I do understand the need of it. Early in George W. Bush's career, uh, the Chinese attempted to dump uh, extremely inexpensive steel on the American markets, which would have undersold American steel, which could have driven American steel companies out of business. George W. placed a 30% tariff, a 30% protective tax on the steel until they stopped trying to dump their inexpensive steel on our market. Once that threat was over, the tax, the tariff was done away with, and we proceeded with normal. That I understand, that I can appreciate. Another contribution of government is a system of patents fostered by inventions. And uh, there is a provision 
uh, the government can protect your intellectual property. If you write an original piece of music, you can copyright it. If you create a brand new video game, you can copyright it. And if anyone tries to use your ideas, your concepts, your music, your words without your permission, they can be stopped by the government and or fined, forced to pay you for your intellectual property. I think that's a great idea, something that we need to do, and actually need to do more of, because all too often we let the Chinese and other countries just rip us off, costing Americans billions of dollars a year. Okay, the Interstate Commerce Act, 1887, regulated railroads. Now, we've discussed this several times. It was believed that the railroads were giving an unfair advantage to larger companies, larger uh, trade partners. If I am a very large landowner and I ship a lot of my wheat, let's say I grow wheat, and I ship a, a lots, lots and lots of my wheat on a railroad, I would get a better deal than you who has a small farm who ships far less wheat. That was wrong and the government stepped in to correct that wrong. Again, that's a good idea. That's a contribution of the government. So, Let's go to our next one that we have listed here, the Sherman Antitrust Act, 1890. Stop monopolies. Monopolies are bad. A monopoly is the almost exclusive control of a type of business. Let's just use oil, Rockefeller, Standard Oil. He owned a monopoly. Now, monopolies are bad because they cut into competition. Competition is essential to a strong economy. Without competition, if you have a monopoly, let's say you own the only burger joint in town, then you can charge whatever you want for a burger. You can produce any quality you want. And if I want a burger, I'm going to have to buy it. That lack of competition is bad for the consumer. It's bad for the employee. Competition creates prices, uh, price controls. Not artificial ones that the government set in, but again, competition uh, uh, allows for fair pricing and higher quality of goods. Let's move forward. The emergency, I'm sorry, the emergence, forgive me, emergence of modern industrial economy, the transcontinental railroad. And here's a little bit of an image of it. Okay. So the transcontinental railroad, let me erase that. The Transcontinental Railroad was completed in 1689. It was uh, the two sides from east westward, from west eastward. Made a promontory port, a promontory point in Utah in 1869. It connected east to west, and of course, railroad, line, railroad lines improved travel. You can now travel east to west, west to east, whichever direction you're going, quicker, faster, and for less money. And as a businessman, time is money. The longer it takes me to get my goods to market, the longer it takes a salesman to get out in the field to sell and back to me, the less money I'm going to make. So the Transcontinental Railroad connected east to west, and then eventually you're going to see all of the country connected by rail, which again means quicker, faster uh, travel, which means money is saved. Technological progress, there's several things that we're going to look at. First off, the Bessemer process, we talked about this previously. It was a way in which steel could be produced quickly, cheaply, and you're producing extremely strong steel. Without the Bessemer process in America, the industrialization of America doesn't occur. And here's a little bit of an example uh, right over here. And so the Bessemer process allowed things like the railroad to be made profitably, and allowed us in big cities to build up skyscrapers. Skyscrapers are not possible without steel. So the Bessemer process in steel production, lighting and mechanical uses of electricity, gives birth to new industries. The ability to create and harness, to control, to deliver electricity at a whim opens all kinds of new doors, all kinds of new inventions. For example, Thomas Edison and the light, uh, light, uh, light bulbs, sorry about that, 
Okay. Alexander Graham Bell and the telephone is an example of that. And so these devices, for example, the light bulb. Uh, you know, we walk into a room, hit the light switch, and don't even think about it. Boom, lights come on. You walk out, hit the switch, lights go off. Imagine if you would if you walked into a room and you had to carry a kerosene or an oil lamp. And that lamp had, lamp had to be lamp for, lit for you to see. We had to walk in the room and find the lamp, get a match, light it. Edison's invention of the light bulb and the ability to harness electricity allowed us to electrify cities. Electric light bulbs allowed us to light the night, which allows us to work 24-7. I mean, come on, let's face it. The greatest fear most people have is of the dark. The fear of the unknown in the dark, which you can't see. That's no longer a problem, thanks to Edison. Telephone service. Thanks to this puppy right here, those evil, illegal phones that you're not putting in the front. They're not possible without Alexander Graham Bell. And so these are just two of the examples. There are hundreds of others. These are two of the examples how the Bessemer process, in part, uh, allowed for the growth of numerous industries. The ability to harness electricity allowed for more. Finally, on this page, the oil industry replaced well oil. Uh, uh, lamps were often lit by using well oil. I mean, you, you, you catch a well, you kill it, and you take its blubber and produce oil. The oil industry, where we pump oil on the ground, uh, took that place. Now, that oil was being used for all kinds of different things. Uh, of course, oil can be converted into gasoline, which, of course, is part of the automobile revolution in the late teens, early in the 20s, 1920s. Uh, it can be converted to kerosene, which can be used to heat and light homes, on and on and on. Okay, let's move on to our next slide. Uh, the great entrepreneurs, and we're going to take a look at a few, not all of them, but a few. Uh, the first term here is robber baron. These were entrepreneurs who were who were perceived as being greedy and corrupt. On the other hand, the opposite side of the robber baron coin was the... Hold on just a second. Okay, I'm back. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, the other coin, the other side of the coin of the robber baron was the captain of industry, who were perceived to be helpful and very generous with their money. Were robber barons and captains of industry the same person? Yes, they were. But the robber barons were these entrepreneurs like J.D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, who were perceived as being greedy and corrupt. Now, again, were they? Well, yeah, to a certain extent. Were they also captains of industry who donated millions upon millions of dollars? Yes, they were. Let's take a look at the four I have there. Uh, Rockefeller, Carnegie, and over here, Vanderbilt, and Morgan. Okay, Rockefeller owned Standard Oil. It was a monopoly controlling the oil refining, uh, the oil production, the oil refinery, the oil sales in America. So he controlled, controlled the oil industry. Uh, he was forced to dissolve his stranglehold. It should be strangle. I don't know what's strong. It should be stranglehold on his company. Uh, books like uh, Ida Tarbell's uh, book, uh, uh, Ida Tarbell was a muckraker, Ida Tarbell's book uh, depicting the monopoly that Standard Oil was, uh, led the way to his company being dissolved. Uh, Andrew Carnegie, steel, U.S. steel, he uh, controlled the monopoly on steel production here in America. Uh, he is one of the early believers of the gospel of wealth that you should use your money to benefit mankind. Now, of course, you know, did he lie, steal, and cheat a little bit to make all that money? Yeah, well, yeah he did. Was he the worst one? No. Uh, but again, you know, there, there were some underhanded things. There, this was the era of corruption. This was the Gilded Age. And so there was some things that he did that kind of went against his concept of the gospel of wealth. Uh, he set up steel production in Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh became one of the leaders in uh, steel production and still is in this country today. Cornelius Vanderbilt started with uh, shipping and then moved into railroad consolidation. Uh, J.P. Morgan, investment banking. 
all four of these men were robber barons, captains of industry. Captain of industry, okay? They all donated millions upon millions upon millions of dollars to schools, hospitals. They built libraries, universities, on and on and on. Vanderbilt University, named after him. The Rockefeller Center in New York, named after J.D. Rockefeller and the money that he donated to have that built. These are just some examples. All right, let's move on. The pros and cons of big business. Now, again, big business is good in many ways. Those are the pros. Pros are good. Cons are bad. Progress. Oops, sorry. Wrong one. Progress. Progress is good. Congress, bad. Pro good, con bad. Okay, some of the pros of big business. Large business is more efficient, leading to lower prices. Quite simple. Uh, you have a national chain of burger joints, Whataburger, McDonald's, Burger King, doesn't, what, uh, doesn't matter what it is. They're going to be more efficient and usually offer lower prices than a small mom and pop store making and selling burgers. Large business is more efficient. They have set and uh, readily uh, available information to all their different stores, which lead to lower prices. Efficiency leads to lower prices. The second one, they can hire large numbers of workers. Big business hires lots of people. The more people work, the more money they have, the more money they go spend, the better for the economy. Number three, they can produce in large quantities. Again, supply and demand. As supply goes up, prices go down, once again leading us to those lower prices. Our final bullet, they have resources to, re to support extensive research and development and develop new items. Your telephone. I mean, probably one of the few things that you, one of the things that you use it for the least is actually to talk on. The telephone you have in your pocket, your purse that you carry all the time is not only, only a telephone, but it's also a movie camera. It's a camera. It is a music player. It is a calculator. It is a uh, video game player. On and on and on and on. How did that come about? Well, that came about due to extensive research and development. R&D. Big business makes lots of money, they can spend lots of money in research and development and therefore lead to the next generation. Ten years ago, cell phones didn't do all the things that cell phones do today. I'm making this video on my iPad. Don't think we had iPads ten years ago. And what iPads, you know, again, I'm using, uh, I think, the second generation iPad. What then second uh, does, is second does more than the first, uh, the third does more than the second, blah, blah, blah. Research and development. Making things smaller, better, more efficient, more cost effective. Okay, let's look at the cons, the negatives of big business. They have an unfair competitive advantage against smaller businesses. Again, since they are producing in large quantities, which means lower prices, they can often outsell smaller businesses. Okay. Uh, our second one, they exploit workers. If I am Carnegie Steel and you start yelling, screaming, I want to raise, I fire you. I walk outside and say, I need a worker. Here come dozens, hundreds of people looking for a job because I pay well, on and on and on. So again, sometimes big businesses will exploit workers because the owner, the bosses don't know each and every employee. If you own a small mom and pop restaurant and you have 15 employees, you know each one. You know their spouse's name. You know the kids' names. You know things about them that you don't have in a big business. Next we have, they often are not concerned with the environment. And this is not always true, but it is to some extent. They are less concerned about the envir environment. They're more concerned about making profit. Finally, they have an unfair influence over government and the government policies affecting them. They can, through 
uh, campaign contributions get access to politicians that a small business cannot get. If I am oh, I'm trying to think of uh, someone, uh, Henry Ford. Uh, I don't know which Henry Ford, Henry Ford the 6th or 7th. Uh, and I donate a couple million dollars to you know, Barack Obama, I get access to him. The guy who owns El Phoenix Bakery here in town, I mean, he can't donate that kind of money to politicians. And money often equates into access. As a big business owner, I can donate lots of money, which gives me access to local, state, national politicians. You, as the owner of a small business, can't do that, so therefore I have more access, which means I can influence them to pass legislation that is beneficial to me, the large business owner, but not to you, the small business owner. A couple more slides and we're done. Okay, we are looking at the rise of organized labor. The problems faced by many workers, long hours, uh, until the 20s when we come up with a uniform 40-hour work week. Many workers will work 14, 15 hours a day. Unhealthy working conditions. Uh, a room the size of this classroom could have 50 or 60 workers in it. Now, let's say this is a textile sweatshop, and each one of your desks is a uh, sewing machine, and we can you know, put twice as many in here. And so we have unhealthy working conditions. Uh, there's no ventilation, no air conditioning in the, uh, the summer, no heat in the winter. It's just unhealthy. One guy gets sick and coughs, we all get sick. Low ages, again, uh, workers often were expendable. You got hurt on the job, you got fired. If you complained about your low salary, you got fired, and there are plenty of people out there willing to take your job. Our next one, repetitive work. It is not skilled labor. Most of the work done in America at this time was unskilled. It was dull and it was repetitive. It was uh, over and over and over and over and over again, 14 hours a day, seven days a week, for how many years? And finally, another problem would be, of course, child labor. And we're talking 10, 11, 12-year-olds. What we see here is the rise of labor unions. You have the Knights of Labor under Terrence Powderly and the American Federation of Labor by Samuel Gompers. And these two men were able to create labor unions with skilled and or unskilled labor and bring about changes with these problems uh, and then improve those conditions. Uh, come up with better pay, better uh, work hours, uniform 40-hour work week, improved work conditions, uh, protection uh, for a job in case you are injured, those types of things. All right, we should have a couple more slides and we'll be done. Let's see if we can get this done as quickly as possible. We should have a couple of questions here, uh, examples of end-of-course-like questions, star-like questions. Let's walk through these kind of quickly. And again, these are... Examples of end of course questions. Okay, let me read this to you. A man of wealth thus beco uh, becoming the mere agent and trustee for his poorer brethren, bring to the service his superior wisdom, experience, and ability to administer, doing for them better than they could do, uh, they would or could do for themselves. Okay, so we have this quote. If you need to, reread it. And the question is uh, the quote reflects the point of view of A. J.D. Rockefeller, B. J.P. Morgan, C. J. Gould, and D. Andrew Carnegie. Well, the correct answer is A. No, I'm sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. Oh, I made a mistake. I may want to write this down. It happens so rarely. I do believe, let me change my answer. I believe that would then be actually J.D., I'm sorry, Andrew Carnegie, letter D., why? Because the gospel of wealth. Basically what he's saying is that the, wise, the rich man is smarter than the poor man and therefore the rich man should essentially tell the poor man what to do. Okay. Let's move on. We've got a couple more questions that will be done. and Again, we are pushing 30 minutes and it's a little bit longer than I anticipated. Uh, right here, our, our first question of uh, the pair we have here. Uh, which group of people would most likely inspire this cartoon of 1893? Would it be union leaders, political bosses, philanthropists, 
philanthropist or nativist? Well, the correct answer, because I think we've gone over this before, would be nativist. You can see in the background here the shadows of these rich men right here, 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 and here, trying to keep this poor immigrant from coming ashore. And there's the dock right there. And so they, these rich men right here, at one time were poor immigrants itself. So it would be the nativists who are trying to keep the new immigrant out. Our last question. During the Gilded Age, there was a notable increase in the federal government for, A, the growth of big business, B, involvement in foreign wars, C, the acquisition of foreign territories, D, the increased, uh, increased temperance regulations. But of course, the correct answer is A, laissez-faire. Okay, so what we have here is uh, the end of our look at the end of course uh, study guide. And this, of course, is our second one over industrialization and the Gilded Age. Okay. Hopefully you enjoyed it, and bye.